Good morning, Quinault Baptist Church. Thank you for joining us this morning for our Sunday gathering, even though we're not gathering physically, but we're gathering through this uh, online service opportunity. And we thank you for joining us and taking the time to join us this morning. Before we uh, go further, I'd like to uh, make a shout out for all the mothers, as today is uh, Mother's Day. And then um, many of you may, be, may have different experience at this time with your mother, whether um, you have a great relationship with your mom or if you don't know who your mom is or your mom has uh, left us. I ask that and I pray that you would take the time to um, honor our mothers and honor God, for that matter, for giving us mothers. And then to be remembering that um, mothers are a gift from God, despite the circumstances at which we're in, as far as our relationships with our, our mothers. We all miss gathering, and the uh, pastors here um, long for the day that we can uh, come back together and gather. So please pray for us and continue to pray for each other. Recalling the words of Paul to Timothy, in 2 Timothy, Paul writes, I long to see you, that I may be filled with joy. We look forward for that day that we can gather again. That would be a joyous day when we get to do that. Maybe that day is not too far from now. As we make plans right now, there may be a plan. There is a plan in place that next week we will have a communion-only service in the parking lot. So be on the lookout for a video that Mark will be putting out this week, this coming week, for more details. So hopefully you can join us next week for a parking lot communion service. The, the, the elders continue to cover your prayers, prayers to seek wisdom as we plan for the reopening of gathering in the near future. We also want to pray fervently for unity for the church as we are separated physically in our lives. Mark has put out a series on, um, in, in, on YouTube, short videos regarding the unity of the church and the challenging Christians are facing at this time of crisis, addressing the danger of division amongst believers over news, information, and opinions. I encourage you to take a look at those videos uh, through Facebook or Faith Life or YouTube, or if you need help finding them, uh, don't hesitate to contact the church for that or any one of us to provide the link and the um, ways to get those videos um, so you can have a, an opportunity to look at them. And then we also want to encourage you to continue tithing faithfully for the ministry of this church if you have the means and the ability to continue to bless the ministry here. To remind you there are ways to give, whether you want to drop off a check or write a check to church or do the online banking and online giving on our website, they're all available uh, to you. Last but not least, again, if you have any questions or any uh, um, needs, please don't hesitate to contact us or the church at uh, info at qbc.org. Today's pastoral prayer is centered around the text in James 1, 2 to 12. Let me read this passage to you first. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. If any, any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. But let him ask in faith, with no doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. 
Let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation and the rich in his humiliation. Because like a flower of the grass, he will pass away. For the sun rises and its scorching heat and withers the grass. Its flower fails and its beauty perishes. So also will the rich man fade away in the midst of his pursuits. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who he loves. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we give thanks this morning to you, for you are our God, the creator of this heaven and earth and all that is in it. You sit above all and are sovereign over all of your creation. We humbly enter into your presence with a confidence that is found only in Jesus Christ, our mediator, savior, and redeemer. We worship and praise your holy name this morning for you are holy, majestic, perfectly loving, and merciful. Father, give us joy during this time of trials and troubles as we are unable to gather together. Teach and reveal to us how to consider it our joy, as James writes, when we're facing trials. Help us to embrace the truth that this is a test of our faith that produces steadfastness, a steadfastness that will refine us and produce in us perfection and completeness. Father, for you are good to us. All things that you give to us are good, and therefore we lack nothing. We ask you for wisdom, Father, for we have none apart from you. We ask in faith that comes from you. We do not have faith, for we so easily doubt your goodness and your ability to provide for us. When we doubt, we're tossed to and fro like waves in the sea. At this time of uncertainties and crises in, our li- in many of our lives, we doubt so easily about your power, your sovereign will, and your love for us as children. As our hearts are filled with fear, worries, and anxiety, and in desperation, we have the proclivity to reach out to other gods for answers. We embrace gods of this world that are counterfeits, the counterfeit God of worldly wisdom and knowledge, the counterfeit God of information and technology, the counterfeit God of medical science and breakthrough, the counterfeit God of government assistance and rescue plans, the counterfeit God of our life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, the counterfeit God of economic recovery and stability, and so many other good gifts that you bestow on us, yet we have made and treat them as gods. We have pursued after the gifts, but have forgotten the giver of these good gifts. Forgive us, Father, for our foolishness. Forgive us for our doubting and wandering hearts. Have mercy on your children who lack wisdom. Bring us to a lowly place, Father. Bring us, your children, and your church back to you. Guard our hearts against the pursuit of these vain and counterfeit gods, for they never satisfy, but always disappoint, humiliate, and rob us of joy. Father, by your Spirit, grant us the power, ability, and capacity to stand firm in the midst of this this testing time. Protect us, your children, your church. Deliver us from our own foolishness and pride. We humbly submit these requests, but confidently trusting you, Father, in providing the faith, wisdom, and joy we need so desperately. For we ask these things in the powerful name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Good morning, church. It's great to be together, even if it is uh, remotely. It's good that you have joined us now as we look at God's Word. And I would reiterate what James has already said regarding Mother's Day. We do love our mothers. Sherry and I's mothers are both with the Lord at this time. 
but we were grateful for all of the training and the things which they left us, the heritage that they left us in Christ. And so we wish all of the mothers today a great Mother's Day and uh, trust that you are hoping in Christ in all things. We look now to the Word of God. She was a vibrant, energetic, beautiful 17-year-old young lady. Being an excellent pianist, she, along with others, volunteered to lead worship at a Christian camp. And yet the night before her life changed forever, she wrote in her journal words to the effect of committing her life to serve her Lord wherever and whatever he would desire. Less than 24 hours later, she fell 45 feet, leaving her paralyzed from her knees down. Wouldn't you think that after such a sincere commitment to serve God with her young life, that God would have spared her from such a tragic accident? You might think that way unless you know and believe in the sovereign God. Unless you know and believe in the God who controls every single circumstance. Often when so-called accidents happen, like happened to this young lady, our first question is to ask, why, Lord? Why did you allow this to happen? We asked that question on 9-11. We have asked that question regarding the coronavirus pandemic. Why, Lord? And let me be quick to say that it is not wrong to ask why. Read through the Psalms. Read through other passages of Scripture. And you find God's people asking God why. That's okay. Okay. But understand that it's not okay to demand an answer from the sovereign God to the why question. You recall that the Apostle Paul asked God to remove from him what he calls a thorn in the flesh. And God's answer, my grace is sufficient for you for my power is made perfect in weakness. And so the Apostle Paul, bowing to the sovereign God, resolved to, quote, boast all the more in my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. He went on, for the sake of Christ then, I am content, listen to these words, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. In some small way, the 17-year-old young lady, the Apostle Paul, and the Old Testament man, Job, have something in common. Certainly all three were committed to the, do the will of God. And obviously none of the three were or are sinless. But what they have in common is what we might consider undeserved affliction permitted by God. Concerning Job's affliction, one author contends that his, quote, suffering is not only undeserved, but not even understood. This kind of suffering, the author says, comes only through the decision or the permission of God. And that author goes on to say this, because God is sovereign, he alone claims ultimate responsibility for it. And then the author poses this important question. How does one interpret and respond to that kind of suffering. That is the issue, he says, at the eye of the storm swirling around Job. 
Certainly our faith and belief in the sovereign God is currently being tested because of the coronavirus pandemic. Through no fault of our own, we are experiencing frustration. We are experiencing fear. We may be experiencing loss, and we may be experiencing doubt. Why are so many around the world dying? Why are my friends dying? Now, to some degree, of course, we know medically the answer, but can we make sense of it spiritually? That was Job's predicament. And if you read through the book of Job, you will find out that Job never did get an answer to the question, why? But it was through the testing of his faith during this time that Job discovered a lot about his own faith, a lot about his own life, and certainly he learned many things about the sovereign God. In these days for us, when our faith in the sovereign God is being tested, it's Job's experience that will strengthen our faith and our knowledge about the sovereign God that we worship. As we look now this morning at the first chapter of Job, and I would encourage you to read through the entire book, but it, because it builds on the re reality of God's great sovereignty. With your Bibles open or the device that you use, follow as I read Job chapter 1. You'll find Job just after Esther, just before Psalms. Job chapter 1. There was a man in the land of Oz whose name was Job, and that man was blameless and upright, one who feared God and turned away from evil. There were born to him seven sons and three daughters. He possessed 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, and 500 female donkeys, and very many servants, so that this man was the greatest of all the people of the East. His sons used to go and hold a feast in the house of each one on his day, and they would send and invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. And when the days of the feast had run their course, Job would send and consecrate them, and he would rise early in the morning and offer burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, It may be that my children have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus Job did continually. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. And the Lord said to Satan, From where have you come? Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro on the earth and from walking up and down in it. And the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, does Job fear God for no reason? Have you not put a hedge around him and his house and all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands, and his possessions have increased in the land. But stretch out your hand and touch all that he has, and Job will curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your hand, only against him do not stretch out your hand. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. Now there was a day when his sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house, and there came a messenger to Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the donkeys feeding beside them, and the Sabians fell upon them and took them and struck down the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. And while he was yet speaking, 
There came another and said, The fire of God fell from heaven and burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them, and I alone have escaped to tell you. And while he was yet speaking, there came another and said, The Chaldeans formed three groups and made a raid on the camels and took them and struck down the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. And while he was yet speaking, there came another and said, Your sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house, and behold, a great wind came across the wilderness and struck the four corners of the house, and it fell upon the young people, and they are dead. And I alone have escaped to tell you. Then Job arose and tore his robe and shaved his head and fell on the ground and worshipped. And Job said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, Job did not sin or charge God with wrongdoing. There's no denying that Job's suffering headlines the story of the book of Job. This is just the beginning in chapter 1 of what Job endured. We'll learn in chapter 2 that Job's very health was attacked, that God allowed Satan to attack Job's health as well and nearly take his life. But as you read through the entire book of Job, you discover that the real storyline is the sovereign God. There are approximately 180 titles and names of God in the book of Job. For example, titles and names like Jehovah, the Lord, the Almighty, the Holy One. Names such as Redeemer, Judge, Maker. And there's this unique title for God, Watcher of Men. Job laments in Job 29, verse 2, Oh, that I were in the months of old, as in the days when God watched over me. Yes, as you look at the story of Job, you learn that the sovereignty of God is the essential subject of the book of Job. Focusing on this open door of understanding, the sovereign God is the one regarding our own trials. And a firm grasp of the sovereign God rescues us from our myopic obsession with our circumstances. It trains our focus toward someone, capital S, bigger and more powerful. As one author observes, quote, the book does not set out to answer the problem of suffering, but to proclaim a God so great that no answer is needed, for it would transcend the finite mind if given. God is unquestionably sovereign. He always acts righteously and with perfect justice. He is fully aware of every single circumstance that we face. And he knows to the minutest detail our needs. And let me be quick to say that our sovereign God is good all the time, no matter what it is. And so trusting the sovereign God is what helps us navigate through tough circumstances, such as we are in today, or we may be in in the future or have been in the past. We must trust the righteous, the just, the compassionate, the always faithful sovereign God even when we don't know why. As I was thinking through this message, it came to me the encouraging lyrics from that hymn that I 
sung as a child in church, Trust and Obey. Listen to some of the lyrics from that song. Not a burden we bear, not a sorrow we share, but our toil he does richly repay. Not a grief or a loss, not a frown nor a cross, but is blessed if we trust and obey. And so we need to understand that the story of Job is less about what he suffered and more about the sovereign God he learned to trust and to obey. His suffering is but an ingredient in the story. And it functions, that suffering of Job functions as a catalyst that triggers a meaningful relationship between the sovereign God and the man, Job. Johnny Erickson Tata, who certainly knows a lot by, about suffering, has the right perspective, and she writes this, quote, The problem of suffering is not about something, but, capital S, someone. He is the only answer that ultimately matters. And so as we look at the, the story of Job and the account of his life in this period, it's the sovereign God, really, who high headlines the story about this man, Job. But of course, Job is the subject of suffering. And so in an interesting way, the story of Job begins with his impressive bio, highlighting that actually Job is a good guy, maybe even better than you'll find anywhere. Look back again at this biographical sketch that we are given in the first five verses of Job. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was blameless and upright, one who feared God and turned away from evil. And there were born to him seven sons and three daughters, and he possessed 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, and 500 female donkeys, and very many servants, so that this man was the greatest of all the people of the East. He used to go and hold a feast in the house, his sons rather, used to go and hold a feast in the house of each one on his day, and they would send and invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. And when the days of the feast had run their course, Job would send and consecrate them. And he would rise early in the morning and offer burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, It may be that my children have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus Job did continually. He was blameless, a man of complete integrity a good and upright man. He feared God and stayed away from evil. Obviously, we know that he was not sinless. But clearly, he has presented us to us here as a man of great integrity. Internally and externally, he was as faultless as any man could be. We might say that he was a model of excellence and he got this attaboy even from God himself. For in chapter 1, verse 8, and in chapter 2, verse 3, God himself has said, there is none like Job on this earth. Not only was Job genuinely godly, he was also, as we read, fabulously wealthy. And what's more, Genuinely godly, fabulously wealthy Job acted as a priest in his own home. It is reported, as we read, that he consistently interceded with God on behalf of his sons and daughters. And so it is abundantly clear and obvious that God has blessed this man. But why begin the story of Job with this impressive bio? 
Well, it's because this bio of Job sets up the entire storyline. It is what triggers this meaningful relationship that develops between the sovereign God and the man Job. Think of it this way. From all appearances, this godly, rich, model father, one greatly blessed by God, is literally the last person on earth we would think deserves the affliction that was heaped upon him. Now we expect bad things to happen to bad people, but we don't expect bad things to happen to good and godly people. But as someone has observed, quote, the story of Job is not about making a bad man good, but rather making a good man better. When, when suffering strikes the undeserving, like the young lady, the Apostle Paul and Job, we are forced to confront the mystery of the sovereign God whose purposes we cannot comprehend. As Deuteronomy 29, 29 reveals, the secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things that are revealed belong to us and to our children forever. We have the revelation of the word of God. These things are for us, but there is so much more happening in the mind and heart of God that is secret and we do not understand. We will understand someday in his presence, but now here on earth, the secret things that God is about belong to him and not to us. What is clearly revealed in Scripture then is that God is sovereign. Daniel 4.35 is clear about this issue God, quote, does according to his will among the inhabitants of the earth, and none can stay his hand or say to him, what have you done? Consider Romans 11, 33 and 34. Oh, the depth of the riches, Paul writes, and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments. And how inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been his counselor? And so the book begins with this impressive bio of a man who seems to be as good as any man can be. And then we move from earth to heaven. The curtain closes on the, on the earth with Job's bio and his activity, his intercession for his children, and it opens up in the counsels of God in the heavens, a rare look at what takes place behind the scenes, and we are given that look here. Notice it, verse 6. Now there was a day when the sons of God, that would be angelic beings, came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan, or the adversary, also came among them. And the Lord said to Satan, From where have you come? And Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro on the earth and from walking up and down on it. And the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man? who fears God and turns away from evil. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for no reason? Have you not put a hedge around him and his house and all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands, and his possessions have increased in the land. But if you stretch out your hand and touch all that he has, take it all away, he will curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your hand. Only against him do not stretch out your hand. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. I want you to look back at verse 8. For verse 8 should give us pause. 
And the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? There is none like him on the earth who fears God and turns away from evil. Do you understand and see what's happening here? It's fascinating that it is God. It is the sovereign God himself who brings Job into the picture, who first draws Satan's attention to the integrity of Job. That is a very significant detail because that detail immediately establishes who's in charge of what happens in the universe. It could not be clearer when we read these words that Satan is totally subject to the so rule of the sovereign God. Before the adversary can carry out his destructive and wicked desires, his murderous desires, he must secure permission from the sovereign God. I want you to see a very important lesson in this very instance. Satan's evil whims aren't the ultimate cause of our seemingly undeserved trials. Let me say it again. Satan's evil whims are not the ultimate cause of our seemingly undeserved trials. There's an old cliche which goes like this. There's more to Job's suffering and ours than meets the eye. But as you notice, Satan fires back. His argument is, yes, but Job, obviously Job has good reason to fear God. Because God, you have always put a wall of protection around him. You have protected his home. You have protected his property. You have protected his children. Of course he's going to worship you. Of course he's going to be pious and godly. You have made him prosper in everything that he does. Look how rich he is. It's interesting at this point that Satan recognizes also where the blessings come from. They come from the hand of God. But Satan says, if you take away everything that you have given him, he then will certainly curse you to your face. In other words, what Satan is saying in his argument is that Job's piety, his godliness, is nothing but a hollow sham. Of course he's acting godly because God gives him a payoff. But if you strip all that away, Job's integrity and his supposed godliness will disappear like mist in the air. Now we need to understand and be very clear about the fact that what's happening here between God and Satan is not a friendly wager between creature and creator. What's happening here is Satan's declaration of war against the sovereign God. It is Satan saying, I'm going to take you on, God, and I'm going to do it through this man, Job. And it does seem to surprise us, doesn't it, in verse 12, that permission is granted. God says, okay, you may do what you wish, but do not take his life. And we know that later on, even Job's very health and his, nearly his life was taken. But the question here is, here is who is in control? Is it Satan or God? Well, technically speaking, Satan is in control. He is given permission to proceed in any way that he desires against this man Job. But notice that it is the sovereign God who puts Job's Job in this position. It is, it is Job's God who puts him in Satan hand, Satan's hands. It is the sovereign God who clearly marks off the parameters. It is God who chooses the limits. It is not Satan. 
we understand this because we get this glimpse behind the scene, but you'll notice that Job never does understand this, even to the end of the book. Well, the curtain closes in heaven again and opens on earth with the sinister roar of the adversary. The destroyer is giddy to prove the shallow quality of Job's faith, and so we read of these terrible things that take place. Verse 13, Now there was a day when his sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house, and there came a messenger to Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the donkeys feeding beside them, and the Sabians fell upon them and took them and struck down the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. That's bad. But while he was yet speaking, there came another and said, The fire of God fell from heaven and burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them, and I alone have escaped to tell you. And while he was yet speaking, there came another and said, The Chaldeans formed three groups and made a raid on the camels and took them and struck down the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. Just recap through this chapter for a moment. There was a man, we read in verse 1, whose name was Job. Now there was a day, verse 6, when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came among them. Verses 12 and 13, so Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. Now there was a day. And what a day it was. It was a day like no other Job had ever lived through. In rapid succession, he took a direct hit from three tsunami-like tragedies. Wave after wave of devastation swept away every single bit of his wealth. All of his camels, all of his sheep, all of his female donkeys. And this, as if three gut punches weren't enough, the malicious destroyer lands his cruelest blow. Verse 18, and while the last one was yet speaking, there came another and said, your sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house, and behold, a great wind came across the wilderness and struck the four corners of the house, and it fell upon the young people, and they are dead, and I alone have escaped to tell you. To say that Job was distraught with grief is a gross understatement. Which of us would not be crushed under the weight of these trials were we in Job's situation? Philip Yancey is right when he says the question here isn't, quote, where is God when it hurts? The question is, where is Job when it hurts? How is he responding? And we aren't left to wonder. For we read in verse 20, Then Job arose and tore his robe and shaved his head and fell on the ground and worshipped. And he said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Watch and listen as in great anguish Job tears his robe. Visualize Job taking a razor to his head. See Job slowly give way and fall to the ground under the unbearable burden of grief. Job's response here was not some super spiritual or shallow, praise the God anyway, this was a man experiencing real agony. And in like manner, our Savior experienced real agony and distress in Gethsemane as he prayed to God that he would remove the cup from him. And then in those moments on the cross of Calvary where Jesus died and he cried out in his last breaths, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus knew what it was to suffer and to die. He experienced real agony 
as Job did here. But notice the first words out of Job's mouth as they reveal his hemorrhaging heart. Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Do you see this? This is a confession of unconditional faith in the sovereign God. It is proof to us that we read in Job's bio that he feared God and turned away from evil. I want you to notice what Job did not say here. Job did not say the Lord gave and the Sabians took away. Job did not say that the Lord gave and the fire of God took away. Job did not say that the Lord gave and the whirlwind took away. And Job did not say the Lord gave and Satan took away. He said the Lord gave, recognizing the source of his blessing and recognizing God's sovereignty, he says the Lord has taken away. This is full surrender to the will of God. Yes, Job will ask why, but Job does not question God's wisdom or sovereignty. In all this, Job did not sin or charge God with wrongdoing. For Job, for the Apostle Paul, and for the young lady paralyzed from the knees down, the circumstances of their lives were and are chaotic, puzzling, and nonsensical. There doesn't seem to be a point to their suffering, especially when through it all, God seems strangely silent and at times even absent. But this is what Job says in Job 23, verses 8 through 10. We can experience this. We probably have experienced similar things. Behold, Job says, I go forward, but God is not there. And I go backward, but I do not perceive him. I look to the left hand when he is working, but I do not behold him. I turn to the right hand, but I do not see him. But listen to his words. Listen to this confession of faith. But he, God, the sovereign God, knows the way that I take. When he has tried me, I shall come out as gold. Oh, we have limited knowledge. The secret things belong to the Lord. God is omniscient. He is all-knowing. He knows what he is doing. He knows his purposes. And he will carry them out. This is what the Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4. Concerning his thorn in the flesh. He speaks concerning the gospel. We have this treasure in jars of clay. To show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. We are afflicted in every way. But not crushed. Perplexed. But not driven to despair. So what do we do? We do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, a coronavirus pandemic, but to the things that are unseen, the plan and purpose of God. For the things that are seen are transient. They will go away. But the things that are unseen are eternal. As for the young lady, she's still paralyzed, but she continues with her husband to serve the Lord faithfully. Her testimony is clear. While she can't explain the reasons why her tragic accident occurred, she has placed her faith in the sovereign God whose will is perfect. Dear beloved saints of God, if you would sustain, sustain your faith in times of chaos 
and severe testing in times of a coronavirus pandemic which has taken over in the world, you need a firm grasp and a firm grip on the sovereign God. I leave you with these words from Augustine, one of the great church fathers. He said this, Trust the past to the mercy of God, the present to his love, and the future to his providence. Our benediction this morning comes out of 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. Now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times in every way. The Lord be with you all. I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. This is the sign of genuineness in every letter of mine. It is the way I write. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen.